<clears throat> I'm going to be uh, preaching on reconciling love, really reconciling love with wrath, the love of God and the wrath of God. It's going to be a bit more of a sober message. <laughs> Uh, Carrie's asked me if I'm okay several times over the last couple of days. It's not because I'm sad. I'm okay, I keep telling her, but very sober. Uh, you study seriously the wrath of God and the anger of God, and it's, it's a frightful thing if you take it sincerely and in faith. So I'm going to do my best to stay true to the word stay clear of my own opinions as much as I can. So I'm going to use a lot of scripture, and I hope you guys are able to grow and, and learn from it and be blessed by it in the same way that I have as I've studied it. When I was, I think, 13 maybe, I was hanging out with some of my friends, and they were telling us this story about how in the winter, because up, up north in South Dakota, Iowa area, we get a lot of snow. And they had so much snow, it drifted up to just about the side of their roof. And so they were talking about climbing up on top of their house roof and jumping on a sled and sliding down onto the, the hill that had drifted on, uh, onto the ground. And that sounded like a lot of fun to me. <laughs> but it was about mid-July. <laughs> and uh, we lived on an acreage at the time. And we had one of those big old A-frame barns. And my dad was hiring a guy to tear it down because he wanted to repurpose all the lumber and it was too old and dilapidated to have uh, standing up. So this guy was tearing all the cedar shakes off and that left the old planking, which back then they used one by 12 planking all the way up and they'd leave about an inch and a half gap in between each board. And he had torn all the cedar shakes off and it piled up at the base of that roof, just like that pile of snow. And all those gaps all the way up the planks made a perfect ladder. So I had this great idea. <laughs> and I took one of those one by 12 planks up to the top of that 30 some odd foot barn. We should have a disclaimer at this moment in time. <laughs> this is not something that you should try again. No, yeah. <laughs> Doc, please never try this. Right. I'm not saying I was the brightest kid. All right, I just want to make sure we're clear. No liabilities because of this message. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, continue. Well, I started to slide down the roof on a 1x12, and I made it about 10 feet. Well, I made it a lot more than 10 feet, but the board made it about 10 feet. <laughs> And I kept going, and uh, yeah, I had a hole ripped on the pants from about my knee pit to my belt, and it didn't feel very good. Uh, <laughs> the point of that story <laughs> is that sometimes a certain level of fear is healthy. <laughs> so, the text that we're going to start off with today is 2 Corinthians 5.11. We'll just read the first half of that verse. Second Corinthians five, verse eleven. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Let's pray. Father, you are beyond our imagining. We ought to fear you, to reverence you, to honor you, to pursue a true understanding of who you are, especially as your children, we should seek your face. 
I pray, Lord, that you would be with us, that you would guide me and protect me from any wrong thoughts or um, statements that are not accurate and true to your word. I pray that you would use this message, that we would take an honest and true look into our hearts and minds and <coughs> seek you as we ought. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, for much of my Christian life, I have wrestled with the idea that we must fear God. One of the most commonly memorized verses in the Bible is in Proverbs 9, verse 10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And I remember as a young man asking why we need to fear Him, because God saved us. And he loves us and he adopts us as his children. And so it doesn't really make sense. Like I understood if you're lost, you should fear God and get saved. But why must we fear him? Why is that the beginning of wisdom? And I remember receiving the answer that, well, the root word for fear in that verse actually means reverence. And so there's kind of an excusing away of that fear word, at least from my perspective. And in studying for this sermon, I looked at that root word, and that root word is yaira. And it does mean morally reverence, but it also has the meaning of dreadful and exceedingly fear in fullness. And so I think in some cases it does mean to reverence the Lord, but I was looking up some other verses that that same root word are in, and one of them is Deuteronomy 2.25 that says, This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear, this is that Yaira word, of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. And in Psalm 2.11, Serve the Lord with fear, or yaira, and rejoice with trembling. Now there's 45 verses in the Bible that use that same root word. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that there is more to it than simply having a loving and um, caring God and, and uh, trusting Him and having reverence for Him. There is a need to fear Him. A certain level of fear is healthy. Now in a sermon series on the attributes of God, Steve Lawson makes a really powerful opening statement. The most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think about God. And that is absolutely true. I think A.W. Tozer is also quoted as saying the same sort of thing. The most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think about God. You see, <clears throat> when we alter our view of God to make him more acceptable or easy to worship, we're no longer worshiping God. We're worshiping an idol. So when we come across passages or stories in Scripture that are confusing or make us feel uncomfortable, Satan will very eagerly leap on the opportunity to ruin our relationship with God. When God reveals his hatred and hurls his wrath and fiery judgment in the Old Testament, Satan will then creep into our minds and whisper, that's just the God of the Old Testament. God deals in love now. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Malachi 3.6, God says, 
Behold, I am the Lord, and I change not. So then how do we reconcile the God that we all enjoy hearing about, the God of love and compassion, who cares for us and saves us, with the God of wrath, who is also very much in the Scripture? About six or seven years ago, Carrie and I went through a series called uh, Behold Your God. It's this book right here uh, by John Snyder. And it revolutionized the way that I view God. And one of the principles that's taught is the consistency of God. And I, I want to quote directly from the book because I think he does a better job wording things than I can, and um, I think it's fundamental to understanding how to deal with the dilemma of how to reconcile the God of wrath and the God of love. And so I'm going to quote from that briefly. There's three points here. The first one, an attribute is and this is talking about an attribute of God, is something that God has revealed to be true about himself. This is not a truth that we discover on our own. So it's not something that we can um, discover by experience or by someone teaching us it. It is something that is true about him in the scriptures that he's chosen to reveal. There's an anchor of truth here that does not change. It is something that we can learn about God in the scripture. The second point, an attribute is something that is essentially true about God. So it is who he is, not merely how he acts. Therefore, he never needs to maintain it. This is a crucial truth that we often misunderstand because we think of these descriptions of God the same way we think of descriptions of people. And think of it this way. We are human. Good days and bad days, we wake up as humans. We live all day as humans, and we do not have to try to maintain our humanity. Human is what we essentially are, not merely how we act. We may act as a kind human or an impatient human. We may be a thoughtful human or a cruel human, but none of that changes the reality that human is a description of something that is unchangeable and essential about us. If we stopped being human, we would have to stop existing. It would no longer be us anymore. It would be something different, something non-human. Well, God is who he is. So whatever is true about God's character is a part of who he is. For example, if we think about the omnipotence, the possession of all power, he never has to start the day by trying to make himself all-powerful. He does not have to work at remaining all-powerful even after the passing of 10,000 years. It is who he is. He is God Almighty. This is one of his attributes. It is one aspect essential to his deity. If he were not all-powerful, he would not be who he is. He would not be the person that God reveals to us as God. And then here's the third point. An attribute is something that is in perfect harmony with all other attributes. So God, unlike us, is not divided. He is in perfect unity. There can be no division or conflict within God. Every attribute is in perfect harmony with every other attribute. So his love is never at odds with his wrath. His justice and his mercy walk together. And furthermore, every attribute of God influences the other attributes. If he is all-powerful, then his wrath is all-powerful. And we are faced with this dazzling reality that while studying God's attributes, they converge and form a multifaceted divine diamond. And no matter how you turn the truths in front of your mind's eye, there's always more splendor to behold.
So then, how do we reconcile the God that we all enjoy hearing about? You see, God's love is not simply an act towards us. It is also who he is. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. But then God's hatred of sin and his fiery judgment is also a reflection of who he is. God is just as righteous, or is a just and righteous judge. Psalm 50, verse 6 says, And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. So I want to understand there's, there's two camps of people that tend to be on one extreme or the other of the spectrum. On one side, you have people that preach God is love and he's merciful and he's kind, which is, those are all true things. But they can come from a perspective that he's, he overwhelms um, <clears throat> He overwhelms judgment and uh, with forgiveness and mercy, like he sweeps sin underneath the rug. And sin and God's wrath can tend to lose their horror and power in that camp. And the claim is God accepts you as you are. God found something beautiful and wonderful about you, and that's why he died to save you. But then on the other side, you have people who preach a dogmatic application of the law. And this group tends to bolster their pride as they look down on people who don't live up to their standards. And they think about the things that they do, their church attendance or their service to him or whatever it is. And they pride themselves. The reality is, those who preach God's love cannot fathom the magnitude of his love. Right. The boundless measure of his mercy. And those who judge others and pride themselves in their knowledge of God's hatred of sin don't have the capacity to grasp for one moment God's wrath and his anger towards sin. Right. If we could comprehend for the briefest moment God's anger and wrath towards sin. He would break the proudest heart to pieces. Mm -hmm. The thing is, what gives God's love weight is his passionate hatred of sin, not his disregard of it. So, for example, if my neighbor was to sneak into my car during the week and steal a $5 bill out of the center console, and then he came to me the next week and he apologized and wanted to make it right, it wouldn't be an overwhelming thing for me to forgive him. I mean, it's five bucks. I, you can have another five bucks if he needs it. But if he were to be annoyed at my kids making too much noise in the yard. He grabbed a shotgun and he came over and he killed them all. And then he came over the next week and he apologized to me. That's a whole different story, isn't it? It would be a very difficult thing for me to do. And yet, we are all guilty of Jesus' death. We killed his son. And beyond that, if we're angry at a man in our heart, if we hate him, we're guilty of murder. And that's murdering someone made in the image of God, one of God's children. We are guilty of far greater crimes than we'll ever witness. And yet God is forgiving and loving I think we make a devastating mistake when we're faced with God's hatred of sin because we want to water it down and make it seem like it's not a big deal to God. But in doing so, we water down His love. 
God is not ashamed of his wrath. And we should embrace that part of who he is. Because this gives God's love towards us magnitude. Let's turn to Luke 7. We're going to start in verse 36. Read through most of the rest of the chapter. So Luke 7, starting in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went un into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and had wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. He's kind of fitting in that one camp that I mentioned, isn't he? And Jesus answering him, said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose he to, him, to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou dost not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Well, something I want to point out here is that the Pharisee was not more righteous than that woman. She did deserve damnation. She was a sinner, but she knew it. And that knowledge drove her to love him because of his mercy and his love towards her. Whereas the Pharisee belittled his sin as not a big deal because he followed what he thought was the law. What I want to do here is take a very bold look at Scripture's account of God's wrath and hatred of sin. And so I'm going to read through a list of verses, and I want to keep God's, I want us to keep God's love and mercy in our minds as I go verse by verse. I know it's really easy to zone out or cast out preaching that doesn't mix very well with our prior disposition or belief structure. So I want to use as much scripture as I can so that you can have the opportunity to consider them for yourself. And I'd ask you to try to apply what's in these verses about God's wrath to how God feels about the sin in your life. Another thing to keep in mind is this is not an exposure to a flippant or emotional haphazard response of God to sin. God is holy and he's set apart and he's perfect. So much of the 
pain and agony and anger that God expresses in the Bible, it's out of love. It's out of love for us because he can't bear to see us polluted by sin. He can't bear to see people harmed by sin or through it. Habakkuk 1 says in verse 13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. So I'm going to start this list in Psalm 7, and just for continuity, I'm just going to roll through them. But in Psalm 7, God judgeth the righteous and is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared him for him the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. In Deuteronomy 9, Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came unto this place. Ye have been a rebellious people or rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb ye provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. Notice he's dealing with God's people here. In Exodus 15, Thy right hand, O Lord, is becoming glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as a stubble. Exodus 32, and the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Numbers 11. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. I, has that story ever struck you guys before? Because it didn't ever strike me quite like it did until I was preparing for this sermon, the extremity of this. People that God had just saved angered him by complaining to the point that he burned them to death with his anger. I can't even relate to what it would have been like to witness, but some people watch their family members die, get burned to death by God's anger over them complaining. In Job 4, even if, as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. Now we get into Lamentations, and I could, I could pull off from any part of Lamentations for this. But in Lamentations 2, how hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger? and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord hath swallowed up all the habitations of Jacob, and hath not pitied. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He hath brought them down to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. He hath cut off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel. He hath drawn back his right hand from before the enemy, and he burned against Jacob like a flaming fire which devoureth round about. 
He hath bent his bow like an enemy. He stood with his right hand as an adversary and slew all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. He poured out his fury like fire. I'm not even touching the surface here. There are so many verses like this in Scripture. And I intentionally chose from a variety of books in the Old Testament in order to show that there is a consistent theme. And this isn't something that's just merely in the Old Testament either. In Romans 2, But after thy hardness and impotent heart, treasures up th unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Matthew 10, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. None of the verses that I have said prior to this come close to the severity of what he just said. And all of that is excruciating pain and death, but this is death and eternal excruciating pain forever. John 3, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Have I gotten the point across? I, I know I used a lot of Scripture there. I haven't even touched Revelation. The scriptures are absolutely full of verses that declare that God hates sin with a perfect hatred. Mm -hmm. And I, I fully understand how difficult it is to look at your own sin in that light. It is a very challenging thing for me as I have studied this. Because I know God hates all the sin in my life with more hatred than I can fathom. But that does magnify His love toward us. So in Romans 5, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but Yet, peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall have be saved by his life. God loves us more than an artist can express with paint or a musician with music or a poet with words. He's Love is beyond measure in comparison. He doesn't just offer forgiveness to us in grace, but He sent His own Son to die in our place. And Jesus took all that wrath which was justifiably on us, and He took it on Himself. Isaiah 53 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shears is dumb so openeth not his mouth. I've got just one more passage to read before we close. 
I briefly mentioned Malachi 3 earlier as I mentioned that God does not change. This should both draw us to fear him because he hates the sin in our lives as much today as he ever has hated sin in the past. But it should also encourage us because his mercy and his grace are just as steadfast and unfailing. In Malachi 3, And I will come near to you in judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages and the widow and the fatherless and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Therefore, because God does not change. So if God would change, his anger towards them because of their sin would cause him to consume them in wrath. But, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ornaments and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Let's pray. Father, your word is weighty and powerful. And you are true and faithful. I pray, Lord, that the truth would reach us. I pray that we'd have open and receptive hearts to be shaped by you and to love you even as the woman who came and repented and washed Jesus' feet. Pray that your will will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. As a human being, those two character qualities seem opposed to one another. They seem improbable, if not impossible, to dwell in the same place, the same being, be held by the same person, especially that, that person being God. And yet, as Steve pointed out tonight from the scripture, he is a God of love, but he is a God also of wrath and cannot have one without the other, could not display or demonstrate one without the other. And yet oftentimes, as humans, we tend to I'll call it whitewash. You know what whitewash is, right? You, t- you take some paint and you mix it up with water or thinner and, to the point where when you apply it, you can see through it. But it kind of <coughs> softens everything. It, it, it kind of m- melts it all together or, or obscures it all to where it's not really, you, you, you can't, don't have details. And that's, a lot of times I think where we are with, with God, we, which 
he's whitewashed, he's, he's opaque, he's, he, it's not clear. With his, with his wrath, well, we definitely want to whitewash that. We don't, we don't really want a good clear vision of that. But without an understanding of his wrath, you can't have a good appreciation for his love. Sometimes people have struggled with the garden scene. Why would God throw the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, out of the garden for simply eating a piece of fruit? Because it really comes down to this love versus hate and how to understand that. God knew that that fruit, that whatever it was, was it was a test of their love for him in response to his commandment. But it also represented their their free will, their opportunity to choose what he said would be harmful. And as humans, we we sympathize with the Adam and Eve. We say, well, that was kind of harsh. Doesn't seem just. But then that rolls over and we see that compounding all the way through into our society today where we continue to excuse sin and things that God says is, is abomination and wicked. And We need to not soften or whitewash the wrath of God. Because when you water down the wrath of God, as he said, you water down the love of God. Does anybody like tea? Anybody other than me like tea? I love tea. I love it. And this was, this was a great gift. This keeps my tea hot for a long time. Mint and... Um, Echinacea, and I don't remember what all's in there. I remember those two. Um, honey. Have you, ever, have you ever gone out somewhere and they said sweet tea, and when you tasted it, it just tasted like water? It certainly wasn't sweet. You know, I haven't quite drank half that, but if I just went ahead and added some more hot water. It, it would become less desirable to me. If we take away the wrath of God. If we water down the wrath of God, we also also water down the love of God. We can't do that to either. <clears throat> when we think about, we, we need to allow ourselves to think about the wrath of God in the context of our sin, because that is the fear of the Lord. That's when the fear of the Lord does its work. See, the fear of the Lord is to prevent us from sliding down barn roofs on on. You know, how old were you? About 13. About 13. Okay. Yeah. When you hit the teen, teen anything, the brain cells just start to deplete pretty seriously. And, and you know, they build back up later, but, you know, it's, it's, things just kind of go all crazy. <clears throat> and you teenagers are thinking, preacher, I, listen, you're, you're talking to a guy that will be 53 this year, and I know that that's not old, but to a teenager, that's old. What am I saying, teens? I've been there, done that. I could tell some 
stupid stories on myself as well. And I usually do, and I always g give the, the, the disclaimer. This was stupid, this was dumb, and you should never ever do this, right? You know, Steve, it would be a great illustration to have a pair of those pants that, pants that you had just to show them, very lifelike, this is what happens when you do that. Anyway, but back to serious. Your sin, your sin, just like the sin of Adam and Eve, just like the sin of the nation of Israel, all of their sins, just like as he wrote to, to those in Malachi and when he was speaking to Matthew, to Simon there in, uh, in the book of Matthew, Sin is a very serious thing. Sin will take you to hell for all eternity and never let you out. And we should never try to water down sin and water down the wrath of God because of our sin. Because the minute that you start doing that, the love of God gets watered down as well. And our appreciation for God's love gets watered down. Just the awesome thought that my sins, though many, are covered in the blood of Christ. Never to be brought before my ears again by a holy God that's great that's powerful that's how by the way many men and women over the course of history Jesus Matthew Mark Luke John and and a host of men and women who I there's no way I have time to name, between then and now have surrendered their lives rather than deny their Savior or his word. When you really understand the importance of the wrath of God versus the love of God. And when you experience that love of God, that takes away the sins of the world for yourself. I'm not talking about in your religion. I'm not talking about, you know, when you're at church. I'm talking about when you're at home, when you're by yourself. And you realize, when I think of God, Think of how disappointed he's been in me. How devastatingly disappointed that he's been in me. And that thought is flipped over by how much he loves me. Because he was willing to forgive me of those very things that were so intensely offensive <coughs> to him. And that thought is rounded out with, thank you, God, for your love for me. 